people, my name is Laura Esfeller. I am uh, uh, 36 years old. I live in Southern California, originally from uh, Louisiana, South Louisiana. And um, I work full time in marketing in the gaming and hospitality industry. I was having symptoms of my kidney cancer at least probably two years before I was officially diagnosed. I had, you know, um, really horrible fatigue. I was actually going to my car and my lunch breaks to sleep because I like, you know, just was horribly fatigued. Um, I, you know, was having symptoms like my blood work was really off. My the company I worked for at the time made us do biometric screenings. And so I would go get my blood work done and there would be this like one level that I was like, what is this? Why is it off? And I actually had a doctor tell me, oh, if something was really wrong, it'd be like hundreds off the charts, not like this much off the charts, which obviously he was wrong. It, there was something wrong, right? Um, and so, and my blood pressure was high and I talked to my primary care doctor and she said, well, you have hypertension runs in your family. And I said, well, I know, but I'm in my 20s. It's usually people in their 40s and 50s in my family that have hypertension. So everyone just kind of kept telling me, you know, lose weight, get more sleep, reduce your stress. And at the time, um, I was I was working in marketing for a casino corporation that has multiple properties across the country. And I was the marketing manager over three of their properties on the strip. And so in Las Vegas, since I thought, okay, well, I probably am stressed, <laughs> you know, I was working a lot of hours and, and had a lot of responsibilities. My kids were in middle school at the time or late elementary school. And so just thought that's kind of how things were. Right. And then it was about six months before my diagnosis, I went to go to, um, I went to get another biometric screening done and they almost called an ambulance because my blood pressure was so high. So I went to my primary care doctor. She again, you know, said, lose weight, reduce your stress, right? Uh, I ran my blood work and my red blood cell count came back really high, which I later found out is an indicator of kidney cancer. And I asked her, what is this about? She handed me the results and said, no, you're doing fine. You're doing great. Your blood work looks awesome. And I asked her, I said, well, what is this about? And she said, oh, you probably just had an infection or something over you drew your blood. And I'm thinking, I was feeling fine when you drew my blood, right? But I just, I felt like a hypochondriac at that point, you know, and, and thought, these are all specialists. These are all doctors. They know what they're doing. I, who am I to question it, right? So that was December. And then in May, 10 days before my birthday, I woke up and I just had the most horrific back pain in my life. Um, I was honestly struggling to walk. It felt like there was just like, felt like I was like a puppet and someone was just pulling the strings, you know, like every time I try to walk, it was really painful. And so I went to um, urgent care because my primary care couldn't get me in. They said, yeah, you probably pulled a muscle. Here's the muscle relaxers. Of course, that didn't work. Um, and then uh, it progressed to the point that a few days later from my birthday, we went out to dinner and I couldn't even put pants on. I had to wear a dress because my legs were really swollen. And I'm like, this, something's not right. So I, my mom was in town at the time and I didn't want to freak her out. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so I waited until she left town a few days later to go to my primary care. And whenever I went there, uh, the doctor drew some blood work again and said, something's wrong with your kidneys. Um, I'm going to send you go to the CT scan, go get it done within the week. I said, is this something where I should just go to the ER? And she's like, no, just go within the week. Well, thankfully, I didn't listen to that. I went to the ER that night after work. And um, that's whenever they diagnosed me with a 13 centimeter tumor on my right kidney and told me I needed to have surgery as soon as possible. And that was that was five days after my 29th birthday. I think my outcome would have probably been, actually, I know my outcome would have most likely been very dramatically different had I not gone to the ER that night. But, you know, I just, I, it's frustrating whenever I look back because 
I know I, I had to have had cancer for at least a year, probably longer, probably two plus years. And the idea that had I not been diagnosed at stage four, I could have just had surgery and been done, you know, with it. I could have been done. I wouldn't have reached to the point where I'm being diagnosed with a terminal phase of this disease. It's, it's really heartbreaking and it's really frustrating. And unfortunately, I see it all the time with younger patients, you know, um, and I, I get it. I actually went back and talked to my primary care doctor a few months after I was diagnosed. Obviously, I'd switched doctors at that point. But I went in and I talked to to her and the head of the clinic. And I said, look, I know that you will probably never see another case like mine again. But, you know, there's this phrase with rare cancer patients that, you know, they tell doctors in medical school to look for horses when you hear hoofprints, not zebras. And I'm like, I'm a zebra. Like sometimes it is a zebra, you know, <laughs> it may not always be a zebra, but there, there sometimes it's a zebra and I'm a zebra, you know, and I wish, I wish that, you know, I, and I know that they felt horrible. Like I know, I mean, my doctor was actually in tears, you know, whenever I'm telling her what happened, I know she felt horrible and that wasn't my intention. I mean, it, if I'm being honest, it probably would have been a few months before because I was so angry. Right. But you know, I just, I'm thinking, look, like you're going to go in and treat other patients. And again, you may never see another case like mine again. You probably won't, statistically speaking. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to see other cases that aren't rare on their own. And I think that we are conditioned a lot of times, especially as women, unfortunately, to just like accept, okay, if you're telling me nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. And I'm just going to believe that. Um, but we know our bodies. We know whenever... I, I may not be a doctor, but I knew that something was not right. And I didn't know what it was. Um, and I certainly wasn't thinking cancer in my 20s, but I knew something was wrong and I deserved to be listened to. And I wasn't. And the ER doctor that gave me the diagnosis uh, was incredibly compassionate and, you know, just walked in the room and said, look, you have a 13 centimeter tumor on your kidney and you need to have surgery um, pretty, pretty quickly. And to actually told me to go to a specialty hospital, you know, um, not to just let any surgeon operate on me, which now, now that I know so much more about my disease than I did at the time, I realize it's because it, was a very complicated surgery they had to do. But, you know, I just was, I think I just kind of shut down mentally after he said you have cancer and I really struggled to process it. You know, I, um, I almost felt for a minute there, like if I said it out loud, it made it real, you know, which I mean, I'm a very logical person, but it, it was hard to process. And so um, I remember wherever we got home from the ER early the next morning, because they had been there all night, I had to call my boss. <laughs> like, it was one of the first things I had to do, right? Because I mean, I'm working full time. This is a work day. I actually had a presentation that was due, that I was supposed to be giving that day. And so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have to call my boss and tell him, like, I have cancer. And I actually like sat in my chair in my living room and like was practicing saying I have cancer before I called him because I was trying to, to one, just like make it a reality and to, to keep myself from crying to, to while I'm telling him this. Right. And, uh, it, it just, it just felt like a dream. Like it just like a bad dream, honestly, but it just, it didn't even feel real. And, there was a, it was about a month in between my diagnosis and my surgery. And, uh, and I was in a, I was in terrible pain that whole month. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I just wanted to sleep. I just wanted to sleep and just, you know, not, not think about what was happening. And so I, you know, it took me a while, even after my surgery to, to really come to terms with, what was happening. And I remember distinctly, like after my surgery, I was in ICU for I think about five days and then they moved me to a regular room. And it was in the regular room that I finally was like, I should probably look in my gown and see my scars. <laughs> like I hadn't even done that at that point. 
And even though I knew I had this very extensive surgery, like, I think that was the moment that it really hit me like, oh my God, my life is never going to be the same again. Like I knew that, you know, cognitively, but that was whenever I kind of emotionally processed, like, this isn't just, I have surgery and I'm done with it and I move on with my life. Like this is forever going to be something that I am now identifying as, as a cancer patient and cancer survivor. Yeah, so um, whenever I was diagnosed, I was incredibly fortunate. I know it sounds weird, but it's like it took forever for me to get diagnosed. But once I did, everything lined up into place, right? Um, my um, The ER doctor told me that he was going to, he'd already actually contacted a local urologist in Las Vegas where I was living at the time, um, and that the urologist was going to help me get to either USC or UCLA, California for surgery, the ER doctor was very adamant that I needed to go to California for surgery. And again, now realizing how extensive the tumor wasn't just 13 centimeters, which is very large for a, a tumor, especially a kidney tumor, but it was blocking my um, vena cava, which is your your main artery that brings your, your uh, blood back up to your heart from your legs and all, which is why my legs were so swollen. And so that's a life-threatening condition, which I'm glad I didn't know at the time because I I, I probably would have just completely shut down at that point. Um, but then I realize now that's why he was so insistent that I need to go to California for surgery. And so the next morning we went to the, uh, to the urologist in Vegas and he said, there's one surgeon in town who may be willing to take your case. Didn't like that. Uh, but he said, if you go to California, I'll get you in at US at UCLA. And I asked him, I said, well, what would you do if you were me? And he said, I actually was you seven years ago. I had kidney cancer. And if you go to UCLA, I will send you to the surgeon who operated on me. That's what I want. That's what I want. I want to see the surgeon that operated on you. And so sure enough, he did. He actually walked out of the uh, out of the exam room and called the surgeon on his cell phone and said, I'm sending you a patient from Vegas. And so I got into UCLA. I um, They did a phenomenal job with my surgery. I was incredibly lucky. I had two amazing surgeons who, I mean, it was a five and a half hour surgery. And um they removed my right kidney, my right adrenal gland, most of my inferior vena cava, and um, seven lymph nodes. And so they removed all that. And, you know, we were hopeful that they'd removed all the cancer and that maybe I would need to like do immunotherapy afterwards to, um, you know, keep it from coming back. But unfortunately, that was in June. And then whenever I had my first scans in, August, um, that was whenever they said, no, your cancer is spreading like wildfire. And so at that point, the cancer was in my lungs and my liver and pretty much all the lymph nodes throughout my chest. And the doctor at UCLA said, um, I could put you on this one treatment. I don't know if it's going to work for you. I think you probably should look into clinical trials. But if you do that, you're going to have to come back and forth a lot. And um, I know that's going to be kind of a burden for you to do that. So there's a doctor in Vegas who is a specialist in kidney cancer, and I would recommend you go see him. And I was really nervous about switching my care back to Vegas because of the experiences I had before, obviously. But I decided to go ahead, and I really struggled with it. I actually had debates with my family and friends on, like, am I making the right decision if I move my care out of UCLA? And I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and try it. And I wound up so lucky. I had the most wonderful oncologist who, again, was a GU, a kidney cancer specialist uh, named Dr. Vogelzang. And he, from the first appointment, sat me down and said, look, here's what you have. He explained to me, he was the first doctor to explain to me what specific type of kidney cancer I had answered all of my questions, said, I have 
these treatment options lined up for you, they were all clinical trials because at the time there was no, there was no standard of care for the type of kidney cancer I had. And so he said, look, they're all clinical trials. Here's the one I think is the best option for you. There were three other ones that he had lined up. And then he said, look, I even, I'll even do chemo if I have to, to just continue your life. If we get to the point where nothing's working, which chemo isn't usually used for kidney cancer patients, but I was so young that he just was like, I'll do whatever I can to try to give you as much time as we can. So um, he explained the first trial and he said, it's for different types of treatments. There's, it's a randomized trial. I can't promise you which one that you'll get. We have no control over that, but there is one treatment on this trial that I think would be your best bet. And, you know, he said, look, think about it. Let me know what you think in your next appointment, what you want to do. And I decided to join the clinical trial. And I, I remember, and even now people will say to me, oh, that was so brave of you to choose a clinical trial. And I recognize now that it was a brave decision to do a clinical trial. And I'm really proud of my decision to do that. But at the time, it just felt like, what choice do I have? I have terrible choices to make. And, you know, and you're also in this situation where you're going, if I make the wrong decision, that's my life in the balance, right? That's how it felt. And so, but I just said, you know what? I remember having this conversation with a close friend because she said, you know, Laura, what, you know, are you going to do the clinical trial? Are you going to do the treatment that UCLA recommended? And I said, look, the doctor I met with in Vegas is saying he doesn't think the treatment that UCLA recommended is going to work for me. And let's be honest, I'm dying anyway. So maybe this is a Hail Mary. Maybe this will help me, you know, to, to live a few years. My goal at the time was to see my kids graduate high school. I was like, maybe this will get me to at least see them to get to high school. Um, but if not, at least, at least I'll be doing something that will help other patients not face this at some point. And so that's why I decided to do the trial. Sorry, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. And so um, I decided to do the trial. And I remember whenever they randomized my treatment, my doctor said, oh my gosh, you hit the jackpot. This is the drug I wanted you on. It was a drug called cabozantinib. Um, but it was a targeted therapy drug. And you know, I started it and I, you know, was just, I, was ter- I mean, I was terrified. And of course, my doctor explained the side effects and I'm going, wait, what's going what's gonna to happen? You know, and but I, I mean, yeah, I was like, what, what choice do I have? You know, I, I mean, I, I can't die now. Um, and I knew it. at that point, I knew that I, I had no more than a year. Um, there, there was, I would be lucky if I had another year. And so I, um, I actually pulled my kids out of school for my first day of taking my pills. Um, they needed a mental health day anyway, I'm sure. Like they had been, you know, watching me go through this all summer. And so I like, you know, brought them to this like little, um, this hotel outside of Vegas and they have a really nice pool and all. And, you know, and, and, and then I'm sitting here thinking like, well, gosh, this is probably dumb. Like, what if I take the first pill and I have this terrible reaction? And then my kids are, you know, even more scarred because <laughs> mom had to go rushing to the ER. You know? which thankfully didn't happen. You know, I, I didn't want them to associate me taking the pills to be scary. Right. Um, and I mean, they, they knew how sick I was. Like, I don't think that they knew that I was dying, but like, they knew how sick I was. And so, you know, I always, I always think of that whenever I first started taking it, but, um, but it was not a fun vacation. I always joke that like, you know, uh, the short term for Cabo Zantanib is uh, Cabo, and and I was like, like, oh, it was no, it was no trip to Mexico. Let me tell you, um, you know, the side effects were <laughs> were rough to say the least. And um, I think what's hard about whenever you are a cancer patient that you're doing, you know, um, one of these newer forms of treatments like targeted therapy or immunotherapy is you don't typically have the same outward. Um, 
side effects that people recognize whenever they think of cancer patients, right? Like I didn't lose my hair. Um, you know, I did get really skinny. I always say like cancer was the best Weight Watchers I ever did, um, which is terrible. But like, you know, I I mean, but then like I lost like an unhealthier amount of weight, honestly. Um, looking back to my, looking back at pictures now, it's honestly kind of painful because I, I look at the pictures and go, oh my gosh, I look, I looked sicker than I realized I did. But, you know, you just, like I said, you, you don't really always look like a cancer patient, you know? And so I think people, especially when I got back to work and all, they're like, oh, okay, you're, you're doing great now, right? I'm like, no, I threw up three times before I left the house and had to like drag myself out of bed because I was so fatigued and, you know, and like, also, I mean, totally TMI, but these targeted therapy drugs actually create a lot of GI issues, a lot of GI issues, and you get like horrible diarrhea. And so, you know, it's like, I mean, I was standing in the grocery store aisle, like about six months into my treatment, trying to pick out what adult diapers I was going to wear and had like a meltdown because I'm going like, I'm 30 and I'm buying adult diapers, like, you know, and and then I go to check out and I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, this woman's going to know, right? And she's, she probably thought I was like buying it for a, a grandparent or a parent or something, you know, it, it just, but it, it was just this, um, you get all these side effects that it's like, it's almost, it almost feels shameful to talk about, right? Your, your, your body is crumbling and, um, and again, it's things that, you know, traditional treatment you don't always encounter. And of course, the side effects from traditional treatment are also horrible too. Like there's no, there's no prize in any of this, right? Um, like I said, I didn't lose my hair, but my hair actually turned white. Um, that's one of the typical side effects from this type of treatment. And that was heartbreaking for me because, you know, I'm 29, 30 years old. My hair is going white. Um, my eyebrows went white. And it's just all those things that, you know, you, you try to tell yourself, okay, the prize is I live longer. And it's true. It, it worked for me. I don't regret it for a second. I would do it all over again in a heartbeat if I had to, right? But um, but you know, it, it does a number on you. It change it changes who you are. I'm not the same person I was before I was diagnosed. There's no way I could be. I definitely look at life differently now. You know, I I don't think I'm gonna put that off. I'm gonna put that travel plan off. I'm gonna put this off, right? Um, I tried my best, and I'm not always perfect with this, but I try my best to live as authentically as possible. Um because I, I know time is a gift and, you know, as grateful as I am and I'm, in, you know, such relatively good health now, you know, compared to before, I also live with the reality that I live in six month increments now. Every scan that I have could bring bad news. And so I try to really, you know, um, be as true to myself and, and not in a selfish way, right, but just putting my what I want to do and my happiness and all as close to the forefront as I can. So um, I've been really fortunate. I reached NED within a year of starting Kappamatix, which is like insane. It, that's not, that, that is incredibly hard to come across, to say the least. Um, I had a very rare response. And um, so I was really fortunate. and. I wound up staying on Cabo for another about three years um, because we just didn't know what was going to happen after, you know, after I had that first NED scan. And so in 2020, my oncologist said, look, the side effects are getting the point. I think if the side effects will kill you before the, before the cancer does, let's see how you do coming off of it, which was terrifying because at that point it was my security blanket, right? But I did. I stopped treatment in April of 2020. And now I have scans every six months. And thankfully, I've had NED scans ever since. I just had a scan in January and it's, you know, I'm still NED. So I'm really, really fortunate. And actually, um, the clinical trial that I was on was sponsored by a group called SWOG. And um, I was one of two 
of the 147 patients to have a complete response to treatment. And now I'm actually a, one of my advocacy jobs is I'm a a patient advocate for the committee. And so I'm now actually working with the doctors that did the trial that I was on that saved my life. It's honestly one of the most meaningful things that I do in my advocacy work because it's just a complete full circle for me. I really encourage people, like, you know your body best. You know if something is wrong, you know that something's wrong with you. And I really wish I would have just kept listening to that little voice that I had in my head, you know, in my heart that said, Laura, something's wrong. And I, I, I'm I, glad that I finally did because that's what you know, encouraged me to go to the ER that night. And again, I would just go back to if something doesn't feel right, listen to your body. You know, I think even as cancer survivors, we tend to dismiss things sometimes, you know, and so even, even if you're in your cancer journey or you're a survivor, you have to, it's advocating for yourself as a lifelong responsibility. And so keep doing that. And, you know, I, I've had the unfortunate gift of being not just a patient, but also a caregiver to my mom who passed away five years ago from complications of kidney cancer and lymphoma. And so I I really encourage, you know, if you, especially if you're a younger patient who has a rare cancer, get genetic testing done. And, you know, I have a genetic disorder that unfortunately we didn't find out about until I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, and, you know, I, I encourage my family members, you know, ever since to get diagnosed, have the genetic testing done see their carrier for it as well. And so, you know, I always encourage um, anyone who has any kind of outliers in their health history that would indicate maybe they could benefit from genetic testing to do so because, look, I I know it's scary to have a genetic disorder diagnosed, but man, I wish I would have had the opportunity to know I had the disorder before I had cancer. And, um, and so, you know, knowledge is power in every sense of the word, you are a better patient if you are knowledgeable about your disease, which is what I really try to encourage patients and caregivers to do, is to understand their disease. And also if you're not, if something isn't sitting right with you, even once you're diagnosed, you know, if your doctor's telling you, oh, you should do this and something's just not sitting right, get a second opinion, get a third opinion if you need to. You have to feel comfortable with your care and if you're not you know it, it it will it oftentimes leads to bad outcomes right so you're the best person that's most knowledgeable about your yourself your body and honor that in all the ways